Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, this evening is organized by Radboud Reflex, as you can see. Uh, my name is Rob van der Ven and I work as a programmer at Radboud Reflex. And today we have the honor of inviting Mr. Simon Glendinning. And uh, Simon is a, a philosopher, actually a professor, as you can see, uh, uh, of European philosophy working at the European Institute of the London School of Economics and Politics. And according to my information, he has been trying to elaborate what, if anything, can, uh, if anything philosophy can contribute to our understanding of Europe. And about that question, he is currently writing a, a two-volume book called Europe's Promise. And uh, he's going to give a lecture about that, and especially he's going to give a lecture about what is the European identity, what is the current state of affairs, and what can the philosopher Immanuel Kant tell us about Europe and all the stuff that is currently happening. Uh, he will first give a lecture, and after that there will be a discussion with all of you, so uh, if you have any questions or you want to join the debate, feel free to do so. Uh, this evening will be ended at 9 o'clock, and afterwards, the, the Culture Café, the bar at the uh, other side of the uh, road, is also open. So if you still want to join for a drink, you're welcome to join. But first, a warm applause for Mr. Simon Glendening. Uh, thank you, Rob. And uh, thanks to Radboud Reflex for inviting me here. Uh, I'm very grateful to you all for coming and listening to somebody speaking in English. And I'm sorry that I can't speak to you in Dutch. I'm sorry too that I'm someone who comes from a country which has just left the Euro voted to leave the European Union to talk to you about Europe. Um, I think people are still saying we're still in Europe, even if we're not in the European Union. Now, what I'm gonna say tonight will amount to reasons for wanting to stay. And maybe that will be an issue for you one day too. I hope not too soon. But I want to start with uh, two, two political desires which might seem contradictory. The first one, which is probably the most familiar one, is a desire for national self-determination, self-government, autonomy, independence, sovereignty. The second one, which is far more complicated, is a desire for union with other nations and the sacrifice or partial sacrifice of all the above that that would involve thinking that would be a good that trumps any nationalist desires. Excuse the Trump. <laughs> now, it can be hard to imagine, this is, the, I think, the most difficult part, it could be hard to imagine why one might go for the second if you've already achieved the first. But it's not so difficult to motivate. Achieving the first is nothing if your neighbours are not themselves peaceable. So imagine you have managed for yourselves to achieve the first. You can begin to move towards the second, even in spite of that, if your neighbours are not friendly. And if they really were peaceable, if they were genuinely, thoroughly peaceable, perhaps they wouldn't really be your neighbours in the first place. To put, it, to put it classically, they too would be your brothers. Although we know even brothers can go to war. We're not gentle creatures. Perhaps that's another motivation that we'll discover here. Now, many uh, reasons have been given for the advantages of forming international unions. Some will say, for example, that nations will always only serve a partial interest. That's, you know, they'll they'll favour uh, a national interest 
and that an integrated union can generate something that, as it were, is more impartial that could benefit everyone. Others will stress uh, the economics and the politics of scale, emphasizing the possibility of wealth generation in a bigger market and geopolitical power in a, a greater union. I mean, you, you, the, the Netherlands is a, a small country and you could well imagine that there's a motivation for being part of a, a much bigger political union when that union can achieve a greater sway over the world stage. But historically, those reasons that I've just given are uh, thought secondary to something else which has been right at the fore of the development and the formation and the thinking behind international unions, and that's international security and peace. Sovereignty, that independence of the first political desire. Sovereignty, in one way or another, we think should in the end be sacrificed in the interests, at least of the chance, of a lasting peace with your neighbours in what Kant called a Pacific Union. Pacific not because it's in the middle of the sea, but because it's about peace. So we have really two rival desires that aren't really rivals, perhaps. One for self-determination, but the other for peace. Because however well constituted you are internally is of nothing if you're about to be invaded by your neighbour. But these desires uh, can coexist in different forms and with different and fluctuating intensities. Now, I'm beginning to, going to explore this idea of an international union with you, and, and at a certain point we're going to look at what some philosophers have said about them, about their possibility, some about their impossibility, and about the kind of form that an international union might take. But I want to begin with something close to my home, and uh, I confess my heart, which is an annual rugby tournament, which is going on at the moment, called the Six Nations. Scotland, a proud nation that I'll say a little more about in a moment, is one of the competing teams in the Six Nations rugby. They're wearing the dark blue third from the left there. Ireland is one of the competing teams here too, wearing the green. But Ireland is made up of two nations and they normally play two national teams. In rugby, uniquely, the island of Ireland plays as a single team, an, an all-Ireland team, one of the competing teams in the Six Nations competition, but they sing two anthems at the beginning. <laughs> Scotland, Ireland, along with England in the white there at the end, Wales in the red, France in the... Uh, lighter blue here, and then Italy, also in the blue, second from the right. They're the competing teams in the Six Nations. Now, Scotland is also a nation which is a member of a, a wider union called the United Kingdom. An act of union created the United Kingdom in the early 18th century. The United Kingdom today includes Wales and Northern Ireland, as well as Scotland and England. But the act of union of the two kingdoms of Scotland and England is what the name United Kingdom is really all about. Scotland is a nation. But is Scotland an independent country in, relate, in terms of that first political desire we talked about? No. In fact, neither Scotland nor Wales, nor Northern Ireland, nor England is an independent country, nor are any of them a state. The United Kingdom is a state. And to complicate matters, it's sometimes called a nation too. 
the concept of a nation is pretty murky territory. Despite its historical connections to uh, natio, to birth, blood and soil, people and land, a polity of blood brothers, all equal, nations have always actually, in fact, been sites of some kind of internal heterogeneity, differences within itself. Well, in September 2014, we witnessed an extraordinary and historic referendum in Scotland. The proposition the voters in Scotland were asked collectively to decide on was, should Scotland be an independent country? Now, a lot's been said, uh, maybe you even saw it from here, about how vigorous and enthusiastic the Yes campaign was uh, in this referendum and how comparably muted and negative the No campaign was. Now, that's absolutely true, and it's also not really very surprising because there is something a bit weird and maybe one might think sort of perverse or certainly a bit defensive and even perhaps a bit cowardly in someone saying that they don't want their own country to be independent. It's as if in saying no, they wanted the opposite of being an independent country, as if saying no, they were somehow wanting to be like a dependent colony which is subject to external domination. And it's very hard to get enthusiastic about that idea. But the question could be taken in a different way. Voters in Scotland could have been asked, should Scotland, Scotland remain part of the United Kingdom? As part of the United Kingdom, Scotland is not a dependent colony subject to external domination, but part of a multinational union of countries in which each member has only limited sovereignty. Now, I want to think about people who said yes to both of the, who might say yes to both of these. Should Scotland be an independent country? We can see a motivation for yes. Should Scotland remain part of the UK? Now, there we're moving towards that other, more complicated, not, not a nationalist desire, but this uh, unionist desire. So we'd have a yes contrast in these two cases between, with the first question, should Scotland be an independent country? A yes that be, would be the expression of a nationalist desire for full sovereignty in an independent nation. And with the second, if you said yes to that, should Scotland remain part of the UK, that might be an expression of a unionist desire for limited sovereignty in a multinational union. So most of my attention is on this, um, these alternatives between political desires for independence on the one hand and international unions on the other. Now, whatever they individually desired, whatever motivated them, the, the voters in Scotland, in the referendum in Scotland, made a sovereign decision collectively in favour they made a sovereign decision in favour of limited sovereignty. They voted to remain part of the UK. It was actually not even particularly close in the end. It was 55.3% said no, the, the question being the first question, and 44.7% saying yes. So despite the fact that the yes campaign very understandably had all the kind of excitement and motivation behind it, and another thing, of course, like defending the status quo is never very sexy because there's nothing sexy at all <laughs> about how things ordinarily are. The idea that we could change them is always much more interesting. Despite that, there was a, a fairly sizable majority for, in Scotland to stay. But the United Kingdom is not the only union that Scotland is in. As part of the UK, Scotland is also part of the European Union. Interestingly, this wasn't part of the referendum at all. A yes vote to the first question, should Scotland be an independent country, simply didn't have Scotland's membership of the EU in view at all. The vote was only about leaving the UK. The yes campaign understood that leaving the UK would in fact take them out of the EU, 
since, in legal terms, Scotland's membership of the European Union resides its, in its membership of the United Kingdom, which is a state in the European Union. But it was clear that it had no intention, Scotland, Scottish Yes campaigners, had no intention and no desire to leave the EU for good, though it should be added they had no intention at all of joining the Euro and uh, they wanted as well to keep the Queen. So it's not exactly obvious what uh, sort of commitment there was in Scotland. In fact, in most respects, Scotland and England's attitude, historical attitude towards the European Union, its rather semi-detached status, uh, is um, they're hardly foreign to each other at all, which is probably why a shared internal government has been possible for so long. Supporters of independence in Scotland, though, wanted to get out of one union, but not another. Comparisons in Scotland were sometimes drawn to Norway as somewhere that you know, could survive on oil uh, unimpeded um, by some um, over, overweening neighbour. But of course, Norway isn't in the EU, though it is perhaps a member state of the EU in all but name. At least it pays to be part of something with respect to which it has no contributing voice. There are other countries, though, also in a similar, more similar to uh, Scotland in their relationship to their own regional situation and a greater European one. For example, Catalonia, which is probably called a region of Spain. Though unlike Scotland, they've not been given the chance yet properly to decide the question, Supporters of Catalonian independence, so if it had been should Catalonia be an independent country, people saying yes there, those yes supporters don't want to stay out of the EU either, very like the Scots. For supporters of independence in both those countries, between both Scotland and uh, a region, uh, Catalonia, there's a historic union of some kind that they want to uh, get out of and a new and much larger union that they want to stay in. And it might be interesting to try to consider why one of them looks more benign than the, than the other um, and in fact whether the reasons for thinking one is more than benign than the other are good reasons. Now... I should note quickly that when I've been talking about uh, supporters of Catalonian independence and supporters of Scottish independence, I speak very deliberately in these ways because it would be wrong to put it in more classical terms. More classically, nationally, one would speak of Scottish supporters of independence rather than supporters of independence in Scotland. Scottish supporters of independence or equivalently people with Catalan heritage, people who have inherited the Catalan language from the people who lived historically in Catalonia who support independence rather than supporters of independence in Catalonia. We can't talk in the more ca cla classical way, for example, of Scottish people wanting independence. First of all, um, both movements see themselves not as uh, ethnic nationalist movements. They want to present their independence movements as a movement of a civic nationalism, not an ethnic nationalism, but a, a civic one of people who reside, people who live in this place. Scottish people outside Scotland, who live outside Scotland. I've got a number of colleagues in my department at the LSE who are Scottish. They didn't get a vote in the Scottish referendum. They weren't too happy about that, I can tell you. Uh, people with Catalan background and ancestry who no longer live in Catalonia would be unlikely to get a vote in the Catalonian referendum either. 
No, in the case of Scotland, for example, the people who got to vote are the people who actually live there on some legal definition of living there, and it'd be wherever they were from. But it's the people who live there who would get the vote. And uh, two final points on Scotland and Catalonia. First, Scotland. In Scotland, English, English people and EU migrants mainly Polish nationals in Scotland, uh, who had the right to vote in the independence referendum because they lived there under some definition of living there, they voted overwhelmingly for independence. But the best predictor of voting patterns over the whole of the voting cohort in that region was not... Uh, whether they were Scottish, English or Polish, for example. Can anybody imagine what was the best predictor of uh, voting patterns in the Scottish referendum? Living in the city? No. Age? No. Income? No. Gender? Sorry? Gender? No. <laughs> it was religion. Catholics tended to vote yes to independence. Protestants, no. There is a religious difference here, and I'll come back to that. Now, Catalonia is not significantly different, religiously speaking, from the rest of Spain. But it is an important marker of, of Catalonia as a territory that it has its own language, which is not Spanish. There's a linguistic difference here, and I'll come back to that too. So we've got two differences I want to just hold in the air amongst peoples in identifying certain kinds of preference, religion and language. Anyway, let's put that and put Scotland and Catalonia to one side for the moment. But it's helpful to keep in mind these debates about independence, self-determination and sovereignty on the one hand, and ideals of a Pacific Union on the other. But with that in mind, I want now to talk next about the union that supporters of independence for both Scotland and Catalonia don't, do want to be part of. That union which the UK as a whole voted last year to leave, the European Union. Now, I don't know how much you observed the madness that went on in my country. Um, it was very, very hard for people who lost, I can tell you that. But I can also tell you, as somebody who observed it, and also lost, um, that what won it were not promises to pay £350 million to the NHS. What won it was a kind of slogan, best understood in the words, taking back control. Sovereignty over our own decisions in our own affairs turned out to be the decisive factor. So looking at those original questions, issues around the first political desire were the ones in this case which did not trump this higher order, much more complicated political desire for a Pacific Union or an international union. Now sovereignty is an incredibly important concept in all relationships, at least everywhere, that decisions have to be made about a relationship by partners in it. I want to define sovereignty as the capacity to make decisions for yourself or your group without having to get agreement with others first or without having to ask permission from others first. So in all your relationships, it will think either individually or as a group, when you're dealing with relationships with others, sovereignty is a very key uh, conceptual distinction. Whether in that relationship you have the capacity to make decisions about what you're going to do without having to ask permission of the other. Being sovereign, it, because of this, is sometimes thought to be a bit like being pregnant you can't be a bit pregnant, 
and equally, you can't be a bit sovereign. If you share a decision with others, which you, like many of us do, try to form decisions together, but if we share a decision with others, then that group is what is sovereign, not you. Though you participate, you, as it were, bring your sovereignty into that discussion, but uh, share it there. If you want to decide on a certain course of action but have to ask permission first, like my children have to do, for example, like most children have to do if they want to go out somewhere or bring friends home, they, as it were, the standard thing with almost defining of a child is, is that they have to ask permission from their parents. So very often uh, schools now, there's permission slips that parents have to sign to uh, authorise students going out on an outing or something like that. But if, if in, an, in adult life, um, if you want to decide on a certain course of action but have to ask permission first, you're not sovereign over decisions in that domain. Someone else, as it were, has the final say. And you can well understand that in international relations, particularly between independent, self-governing, free nations, sovereignty over decisions within itself is not just one concept among others. In fact, it's the central concept of international relations. Questions of state sovereignty dominate discussions about the European Union, and they certainly did in Britain during the whole period of the referendum. And the most um, well-known positions over this question of the relationship between um, an independent country and a Pacific Union that it may or may not want to belong to, the, the uh, most well-known positions are, in a certain way, very radical. First, there's what well, I'm sure you've heard of, Euroscepticism. And there, there's a question for the need for or the value of any sovereign power. That's one which can take decisions without having to ask permission first at the European level. At the other end of the spectrum of opinion on power at the level of the Pacific Union are what's sometimes called federalists or Euro-federalists who suppose that ever closer union among the peoples of Europe ultimately requires the formation of a properly constituted European government with the sovereign power like that of a state. Now, some supporters of that idea don't think that that's, as it were, the end of the nation state. A lot of the uh, Eurosceptics, their worry about that second option, the Eurofederal option, or the, the federalist st federal state form of a European government, is that uh, it sweeps away these ancient nations of Europe some Euro-federalists will say, no, they, they remain, but they have a new function. They now become implementing authorities with some measure of responsibility for decisions on how to enact decisions that are made by the European government above it. And that idea about some uh, local administrative uh, implementing responsibility is, might be what is meant by... Um, uh, subsidiarity, the Catholic term subsidiarity, on some views of this, and we can discuss that. Now, both of those positions, the Eurosceptic one and the Federalist, Eurofederalist one, they have actually very strong philosophical co uh, credentials as well as sort of um, uh, informing very deep political commitments. And I don't think either of them should be dismissed lightly. However, I think that our thinking in general on the topic of Pacific unions and also for your own thinking about your own country's relationship to the European Union, our thinking on this is impoverished if we leave it at just these two uh, alternatives between a, a sense that you're either just going to be a Eurosceptic or if you're not, you're just going to have to give up that whole side of things and become a federalist. Because I think there is, as it were, a third position. 
for thinking about Europe's nations and their union. Unlike the Eurofederalists, this position places considerable stress on the role and the, and the significance of states and nations as free, self-determined political entities. However, unlike the Eurosceptics, it regards the virtues of union, where nation states become member states, as overwhelmingly strong. Now, that idea that we're going to place special significance on member states as free, self-determined pol polities, that we're going to hold that together with the idea of a union, uh, is, I think, unavoidably paradoxical. And I think this is quite interesting, that the most interesting position that I'm going to try to outline for you on the virtues of European Union is extremely unstable and very paradoxical. But it is the idea of a union of free states. One author talking about this says that it's not crossing the Rubicon. So if you've got the uh, nation state form on one side and the federal international state on the other. It's not about crossing the Rubicon from the nation state to the international state, but sailing on the Rubicon, trying to hold a position as stably as you can in a federation, not a federal state, but a federation of states, a union of free states. And in what follows, I'm going to sketch three philosophical representatives to illustrate uh, this scene. And my cast of characters here are all German, which is also an interesting thing, and we may want to talk about that. But here's the cast of characters. First of all, we're going to have a philosopher called Hegel, who is, for our purposes, uh, plays the role of a Eurosceptic. Then we'll have Jürgen Habermas, who will play the role of a Federalist. And thirdly, Immanuel Kant, who plays the role of this insufficiently heard thinker of a sort of third way in this idea, paradoxical idea of a union of free states. Now, uh, Kant was actually uh, the first of these three. His writings on, um, I mean, it's kind of unbelievable, but Kant wrote about the formation of a union, a European Union, in the 1780s. And I'll quote him later. It's a rather long quote, but I'll put, put the words on here, where we can see Kant unbelievably, but also completely brilliantly, anticipating the emergence of a European Union. But he was doing that in the 1780s, 1790s. Hegel followed him in the 1810s and 20s, when he was writing about international relations. And then Habermas, in our time, in the 1990s, still talking about it now. And I'm going to try to go through each three of these thinkers to try to explain why I think Europe in the form of a European Union matters today and why I would recommend you to stay in the EU if you are ever uh, to be offered the vote or confronted with a vote in this country. Actually, I really don't think I need to worry too much about the Netherlands voting to stay in the EU. However, I do want you to think about what kind of future you want for that union. And, and, and so when we're looking at these three alternatives, in particular the, uh, the relationship between Kant and his paradoxical idea of a union of free states and Habermas on his much more classical idea of a, a, federal, a federal state in Europe. So we're going to start with Kant. And, uh, of course, Kant was first and hate. That was Habermas. He doesn't like it. <laughs> he really doesn't like it when I talk to him like this, about him like this. Um, both Hegel and Habermas are attentive uh, to Kant. But in a certain way, interestingly, neither hear him, or rather they only want to hear him as belonging to the binary that they limit themselves to, which is the binary between a federal state on the one hand or an independent state, nation state on the other. <clears throat> 
sovereign nations versus a supranational state. Nevertheless, they both begin, Hegel and Habermas will both begin with what they think Kant says and then stake out their position in relation to whatever it is they think he said. And I'll try to introduce this. This is a bit, uh, it's a bit difficult. I mean, um, if we had loads and loads of time, I could do them one at a time, but I'm trying to set, set the picture, see how they're relating and talking to each other. Now, Hegel, whatever Kant did say, Hegel thought that Kant believed this. Hegel thought that Kant believed that global perpetual peace would follow the realisation of a worldwide cosmopolitan existence achieved through the formation of a union of states, a world union or world government. That's what Hegel thought that Kant said. Hegel thought really that Kant was going to be arguing for world government as the means for achieving perpetual peace. A world government capable of uniting the particular wills of nations. Imagine you're all nations. It's nearly almost a European Union here. Imagine, a bit more. Uh, imagine you're all nations, you have particular wills. This world government would form itself around what one might call the general will, that which is, would be willed by all of you, because it would be in the good of the whole. Hegel thought Kant was mad to believe that, that this would be what would result. And so he says this rather long quote, but we can read it quite slowly. This is Hegel speaking. Kant's idea was that eternal peace should be secured by a union of nations. This union should settle every dispute, that's a sovereign power, make impossible the resort to arms for a decision, that's a sovereign power, and be recognised by every nation. This idea assumes that nations are in accord. But this is an agreement which, strengthened though it might be by moral, religious and other considerations, always rested on the particular sovereign will of nations and was therefore liable to be disturbed by the element of contingency. I'll explain this in a moment. Therefore, when the particular wills of nations can come to no agreement, the controversy can be settled only by the resort to arms, only by war. <coughs> now, what he's imagining here is that the agreement we achieve when we form ourselves into this new world government and agree to participate in its authority, that agreement, maybe we can get it. Each one of you is a particular will, as, as he puts it here, the like you're each of you nations, your sovereign will of nations. And maybe at the beginning you think this is great. But then he, he says, uh, this which rests on the particular sovereign will of nations was liable to be disturbed by the element of contingency. Now what he means there is that well, when you, came, when you wrote the agreement and you all agreed to abide by the authority of the world government, it seemed like it was going to work for you. But what if you, perhaps you alone, it doesn't work for you anymore? Something about the way this world government is uh, working and perhaps the way uh, your nation uh, fit, fits into this order of things, it's just stopped working. Are you going to just lie back and say, well, it's rubbish for me, but clearly it's great for everybody else. Can, uh, Hegel thinks that um, the agreement that you reached at the beginning will be disturbed by these contingencies, stuff that happens, and stuff always happens, that's history. And at that point, when you, the will of a nation can come to no agreement, he says, well, what do you do? Either you lie down and you just accept that your will is no longer going to count anymore, or as an, a nation, with a will, you're going to resist. And the controversy, if it can't be settled by some new agreement, maybe we'll give you lots of money. Uh, but if it can't, maybe it will be a resort to arms and war. So Hegel concludes that the relation of nations 
to one another has sovereignty as its principle. Their rights, as states, have reality not in a general will, which is constituted as a superior power, but only in their particular wills. Hegel can be counted as a profound sceptic about international unions. He thought that there was a kind of intrinsic instability in any agreement reached, and that intrinsic instability is simply the reality of contingency. That where, whereas when you started out, it looked like it was going to be great and you thought it would work well, it turns out it's not working so well. Actually, maybe it's a bit of a disaster. Actually, maybe it's ruining my country. And then you start to move. So Hegel uh, is a sceptic about these international unions and Kant, who we know wasn't opposed to international unions, so for Hegel, he's going to get rejected as a fantasist. Habermas thinks Kant wasn't so crazy, though. Indeed, he thinks that Kant was basically right. What is it that Kant said that Habermas liked so much and Hegel dislikes so much? What Habermas says about Kant will give us a clue why both he and Hegel actually misunderstand him. So this is Habermas writing about Kant. To the very end, Kant advocated the idea of a world government. Now, that's exactly what Hegel thought. So, good on you, Habermas, you've been reading Hegel at least. Even though, to the very end, even though he proposed, okay, so it wasn't what he said, but he proposed, what he did propose was a surrogate of a League of Nations as a first stage towards realising such an end. This weak conception of a voluntary association of nations which are willing to coexist peacefully while, ne while nevertheless retaining their sovereignty seemed to recommend itself as a transitional stage on the way to a world government. Now, it's quite true that Kant thought that we might approximate ever closer to a condition of peaceful coexistence. That was, as it were, the aim of international relations, go ever closer to a condition of peaceful coexistence, ever closer to a condition in which war then has been not only been made less likely but actually abolished, ever closer to the achievement of perpetual peace. But Kant, as we'll see in a moment, never proposes what Habermas calls this surrogate of a League of Nations, <coughs> as a transitional stage to a world government. In fact, what Kant thinks we can do is approach closer and closer to the surrogate. That, Kant thought, was the best we could hope for. He never thought we could eliminate the chance of war, making it less likely, though, we could do through the formation of the surrogate, a League of Nations that Kant actually calls a substitute, not a surrogate, which better expresses, in a way, its non-temporary nature. That, the substitute, is the best that we can hope for. This is the best one can hope for, Kant thinks, in a world like ours, in an international order in which, as Hegel rightly says, but in fact following Kant, that the relations of the nations to one another has sovereignty as its principle. As long as the relations between states has sovereignty as its principle. Kant will say we cannot make this further step towards an international government, a federalist form. Although Habermas is wrong to suppose that Kant ever thought that a voluntary association of na nations should be conceived as a transitional stage towards a world government, Kant does have a transitional stage in view not from a World League of Nations to a world government, but from a European League of Nations to a World League of Nations. And I want to now show you the extraordinary passage in which Kant anticipates the emergence of the European Union, something that took a further 200 years to even achieve the outlines of. Kant actually thought he was not the first to imagine this happening on our continent. 
uh, Abbe Saint-Pierre and uh, Rousseau, he thought, uh, also had similar ideas, but they were ridiculed, and he thought rightly ridiculed, because they thought it might happen tomorrow. Kant thought it might take 200 years, which it did. Rather long again. Okay, so imagine we are European states and we're all going to be interdependent already. The effects which an upheaval in any state as a result of war with another state produces upon all the others in our continent, where all are so closely linked by trade, are so perceptible that these other states are forced by their own insecurity to offer themselves as arbiters, albeit without legal authority. So, the th first thought there is that if two of you go to war, we're, all the rest of us are so caught up in our relations with each other, especially through trade, there's a kind of massive interdependence of these nation-states through trade. If two of them go to war and there's this huge upheaval in one of them, we're going to be affected too. We don't just, as it were, remain... Uh, just mere bystanders to this. And in that context, Kant thinks that we other ones who aren't involved in the war will try to resolve the conflict, although we have absolutely no legal authority to do so. But when we do this, when we start acting in this kind of concerted way to, to resolve uh, uh, an armed conflict somewhere on our continent, Kant says they indirectly prepare the way for a great political body of the future, without precedence in the past. Although this political body exists for the present only in the roughest of outlines, it nonetheless seems as if a feeling is beginning to stir in all its members, each of which has an interest in maintaining the whole. And this encourages the hope that after many revolutions, the highest purpose of nature a universal cosmopolitan existence will at last be realised as the matrix within which all the original capacities of the human race may develop. So a transition from this political body of the future formed in our continent, in which a Pacific Union is formed, which in some way will provide a model for the world. Now Habermas claims, and I think wholly unjustifiably claims, that Kant conceived the global version of this great political body to be only a transitional stage to world government. Moreover, Habermas thinks that the transitional stage that uh, Kant describes is weak, conceptually flawed and sterile. But I think Kant thinks the opposite's true. Indeed, I think Kant thinks that were the transition somehow made from this League of Nations formation of a, a federation of free states into an international state, this could only lead to, Kant thinks, disaster, what he calls a soulless despotism and the graveyard of freedom, a condition of human misery that could only make conflict and war more likely. Interesting thought here that the movement towards an international state, a federal state, rather than being, the, as it were, the, the, the way of completely removing the threat of war and violence, make it only more likely. And I'll explain why he thought that in the end, and that will bring us back to Scotland and Catalonia as well. Now, what perhaps seduces Habermas into thinking that the Kantian idea of a negative substitute, this League of Nations, or Federation, as Kant calls it, what makes Habermas think that that's a transitional stage may be one passage from Kant where he says that the only fully rational step would to achieve perpetual peace would be the formation of an ever-expanding ever international state. So here's Kant. There is only one rational way in which states coexisting with other states can emerge from the lawless condition of pure warfare. Just like individual men, they must renounce their savage and lawless freedom, adapt themselves to public coercive laws, and thus form an international state, which would necessarily grow until it embraced all the peoples of the earth. 
Now, that certainly looks like Kant thinks that the ideal, the rational ideal, would be an international state. But far from endorsing this view, Kant immediately dismisses it. Dismisses it. I don't mean he dismisses it two pages later. He dismisses it immediately and completely. He says, if we're starting from conditions in which states understand themselves as sovereign powers, if that's our beginning, if we're beginning with states which understand themselves as sovereign powers, which actually means if we're thinking of them as thinking of themselves as nation states, and that means, because there can't be nation states unless people think they are nation states, unless there are, as long as there are nation states, then the truly rational step, this one rational way, cannot be made. So Kant goes on immediately. States, however, in accordance with their understanding of the law of nations, that's the relation being bound by sovereignty, by no means desire this. And the positive idea of a world government cannot be realised. If all is not to be lost, this can at best find a negative substitute in the shape of an enduring and gradually expanding League of Nations likely to prevent war. The latter, that League of Nations, may check man's inclination to defy the law and antagonise his fellows, although there will always be the risk of it bursting forth anew. That's the situation that Kant thinks is the, is the best one can get. So, paradoxically, again, rather than the rational ideal being the best, the best, in fact, uh, is one step short of that. This is in a situation where nation-states understand themselves as such. Do we, today, are we in a situation in which nation-states no longer understand themselves as nation-states? I don't think we are in a position where that's no longer the case. And in fact, it's that basic fact about nation-states that is a basic fault of the EU for many people who want it to become a federal entity. However, it's also that basic fact, as long as there are nation-states that think of themselves as nation-states, then they cannot, then the uh, positive idea of a world government cannot be realised. It's that fact that makes the Federalist proposal for transferring sovereignty to a European level so absurd. Kant says here, that the states by no means desire this. They by no means desire the formation of an international state. The German is more literally, it is not the will of the nations to form that state. Now, one might think that he's just saying, look, right now they don't desire it. Right now, they don't will it. But maybe tomorrow, you know, we'll convince them, we'll get the arguments going and we'll get them to see that actually the best thing all around would be as if, would be if they were to will it, if the international state idea was to be the will of a nation. Maybe next week they'll desire it, even if right now they don't. But Kant's point is different. When he says it's not the will of the nations to form an international state, he means it's not the sort of thing a nation can will. Self-abolition is not the sort of thing a nation can intelligibly will for itself. It's not something it can make sense of as among its possible interests. Remember Kant saying that the reason why the union will form in the first place is that each sees an interest in maintaining the whole but what they can't see is an interest for themselves in their own abolition so Kant thinks that it's not just that they by no means desire this right now but as it were nation states can't ever desire that because it's not the sort of thing that a nation state can desire but he thinks all is not lost because beyond both Euroscepticism and Eurofederalism, 
We can hope, nevertheless, for this enduring league of nations or a federation of states likely to prevent war, and hence then this paradoxical conclusion that the negative substitute, with the sacrifice of sovereignty it entails, while falling short of the rational ideal, could not in fact be bettered. So sharing sovereignty in areas where you can enhances the sovereignty you keep by making war less likely. And so although you share some of your sovereignty, what you retain is your independence and freedom as a state to, to run your own affairs without now having the risk that your neighbours are going to invade you. So the situation is of this third way is not just the independent states of Europe, nor a United States of Europe, which is the federalist idea, but instead a united Europe of states with limited sovereignty all round. Now, I said that an international state is something that Kant thought, were it to happen, if that second one were to happen, a United States of Europe, it would lead to disaster. Now, why did he think that? He thought it would, as he puts it, result in a soulless despotism which will lapse into anarchy. And he gave two reasons for this. The first, which I don't think applies so much today, he says, the laws progressively lose their impact as the government increases its range. Now, this is the idea that empires, the further they reach out, if you think of the Roman Empire, that at the limits of the empire, it's almost ungovernable, unmanageable. And so Kant was thinking that one of the main problems with an international state is that it can't uh, govern in that kind of reach. The second one, which I think still does apply, is he says powerful states, and indeed this is the secret desire of all states, would like to secure peace by dominating the whole. Now the point here is that any will of the international state is itself a particular will. Now, who in our collectivity of particular wills could share the particular will of that international state? Well, only one which sees itself in that power. So that if they see that that sovereign will the interests that it serves are identical to their own interests, they would support that sovereign power because they would like to see their own majesty, as it were, reflected by dominating the whole. But that attempt at a sort of hegemony over the whole is uh, prevented, Kant thinks, by two types of differences that, as Kant puts it, separate nations and prevent them from amalgamating. And he names two, linguistic and religious differences. A single government could rule over people with such differences. And Kant says there's a kind of germ of goodness in the ambition to have this international order. But for Kant, it can only end badly. Instead of a league of nations in which people's might reach various levels of understanding mutually, maintaining the vitality of their differences, Kant considers a single authority always to be the expression of a particular will and never the expression of an abstract general will. And hence it produces what he calls a universal despotism, which saps all men's energies, he says, and ends in the graveyard of freedom. And ending in the graveyard is obviously not the eternal peace we were looking for. Now, linguistic and religious differences are the most significant cultural markers in the cases of Catalonia and Scotland too, and remain the spur for a nationalist desire for independence from an integral state. And on the other hand, though, knowing that it signifies peace, these development, these uh, identities linguistic of linguistic and religious differences are also at the bottom of a unionist desire for a limited sovereignty that would produce uh, conditions of peace and stability and mutual understanding so far as that is possible. And Kant's idea is that we can produce this and this will be produced first 
in a united Europe of states, a federation of states, not a new federal state. Now, somebody might wonder whether, and this is my last thought, whether this is really what the European Union is all about. We are often told about ever closer union. Isn't the idea of the union moving towards an increasingly federal structure of, a, of, a, of a, a, an international European government? Well, of course, the words in the treaties are ever closer union among the peoples, plural, of Europe. Not ever closer union of the people of Europe, but the peoples of Europe in their nations. And what I want to suggest is that the uh, idea of ever closer union is one of increasing mutual understanding and uh, mutual respect, not of moving towards a, a condition of a single government. And it's very significant for me that one moment that took place in the UK's pre-referendum negotiations in Europe related to this hugely important point. And I want to show you, to finish with, the wording that was rejected by the European Union that I hope still can become the norm one day for Europe. This was the passage on sovereignty in the agreement between Britain, uh, the British government, and uh, uh, and and the um, and in Brussels, powers in Brussels, that formed the base of the agreement. This was the first formulation, and unfortunately, it was rejected. References in the treaties and their preambles to the process of creating an ever closer union among the peoples of Europe are primarily intended to signal that the union's aim is to promote trust and understanding among peoples living in open and democratic societies, sharing a common heritage of universal values. They are not an equivalent to the objective of political integration. Now, that was a Kantian formulation, more or less, at the heart of what could have been an agreement that kept Britain in the European Union. But this was rejected, rejected on the Brussels side, as something that would go against the desires of some nations. Now, Kant would say it couldn't have gone against the desires of some nations, except in so far as they might want to achieve hegemony in that space. So last summer, the majority of voters in the UK voted to leave the EU, the great political body that lay in Kant's future, and which I hope doesn't belong to our past. But it's pretty sure to me, clear to me, that its history is not over. Thank you very much.